Good morning, everybody. We've had gaps on supermarket shelves for weeks. Now, some petrol stations are being forced to close for the same reason, a shortage of HGV drivers. The government insists there's no need to panic buy as there's no actual shortage of fuel. But there's increasing criticism that ministers should have done more to avert the crisis. Shaman Freeman Power reports. Supermarkets, oil companies and major retailers are clear. They're running short of one thing, lorry drivers. Companies say they have plenty of produce for everyone, but not enough drivers to deliver it. It's an issue of supply and demand. BP says it cannot supply the petrol because there is such a high demand for HGV drivers, forcing them to ration fuel and close shops where that's not possible. The issues driving this crisis are complex. Brexit, the pandemic and an ageing population are just some of the issues that play here. Many non-UK workers went home. Drivers are leaving faster than they can be recruited. And the pandemic caused delays to the HGV tests. But this could just be the start. There are easier jobs in the world to do than driving a truck. It's a tough job, it's an expensive job to train. There's no early end in sight to this. We'll probably be having to live with a trucker shortage for at least another year or so, even if the government tackles the issue urgently, uh, which they haven't really up to now. This is all happening as winter is coming, and it may be one of discontent. The whole movement of food logistics around the UK, getting things from farms, to processing uh, factories from the processors off to the warehouses and from the warehouses to the shops. And without the HGV drivers with the glue of that process, it is not possible for consumers to get the products on the shelves that they need. Industry insiders are urging the government to provide temporary work visas to encourage drivers to return. If not, they say, we can expect to see a return of panic buying over coming weeks. Shimon Freeman Powell, Sky News. Grant Shapps, Transport Secretary, joining us now. Mr Shapps, uh, good morning. Good of you to join us this morning. Uh, what's your advice to motorists at the pump today? Um, advice would be carry on as normal, and that's what BP are saying uh, as well. Um, they describe it on the average day that they have a handful uh, of petrol stations uh, that they have to close out of 12 or 1300. Uh, and the problem's not new. There's been a lack of drivers uh, actually for many months through this pandemic, uh, because as your report just said, uh, during the lockdown, drivers couldn't be passed through their lorry HGV tests. And that's what's led to this problem. Uh, but many more tests are being made available now. Uh, so we should see it smooth out uh, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, not according to the Road Haulage Association. They say it's another year of um, angst. Yeah, there's a difference between um, it, the this specific issue in the very short term and the much longer term uh, issues, because it, in fact, in point of fact, uh, I was talking to the, the chief executive of uh, the largest uh, road haulage uh, uh, organisation, Logistics UK, and he said he's been in the job for five years and the very first thing on his desk was, was the shortage of uh, lorry drivers and it's never gone away. That said, most people won't have ever noticed that. So there's a difference between uh, what is a, a systemic shortage, which we want to deal with, but also the shorter term problem of people not having been able to take their tests during coronavirus for understandable reasons, and the number of new tests that we've now made available by doubling the supply of those tests. Uh, it would be disingenuous to say that's the only reason. Um, well, COVID is the main reason. It's a global um, problem and um, Europe has hit particularly bad. Um, we've got, for example, in Germany, a 60,000 shortage. In Poland, a 123,000 shortage of lorry drivers. Um, so it is, as I said, it is the, the, the principal cause of the problem and we're working very hard to change it, including changing the laws in order to uh, provide more tests for uh, HGV drivers and encouraging people to come back into the into the market. But you're right, there are longer term problems, which is it's a, a difficult, uh, a, a long day's work, it's a hard work, it's a skilled job and actually it's been underpaid up until now. So we very much welcome the salaries going up, the wages going up and that's attracting more people back to the sector. A quick fix would be short-term visa for drivers in Europe to come to the UK. 
Uh, I'll look at everything and we'll move the heaven and earth to do whatever we can to um, make sure that shortages are uh, alleviated with uh, HGV drivers. But uh, we, we need to look at the things which are going to make a difference. And the big problem is the, the, the testing of drivers coming in. You get an attrition rate, people retire. If you can't get new people in and we, we, we were unable to test 40,000 drivers during coronavirus. That's the principal um, problem. Uh, and of course, there are already six million EU nationals with settled and pre-settled status, some of whom will already be eligible to, to drive. Uh, enticing them to come here is really the higher salary. Uh, and we just need to make sure that, that tests can be passed uh, if people have perhaps have an expired licence uh, but want to get back to driving a lorry. Uh, move heaven and earth um, to get them to come here. Reports this morning in the newspapers that the Environment Secretary wants uh, these visas for skilled workers to um, have a short-term visa for lorry drivers from Europe. You and the Home Secretary do not. Is there any truth in that story? Uh, no, actually, uh, we're, we're at one on this. I think he's actually talking about the seasonal workers um, scheme specifically. And as I say, I wouldn't rule out doing something or, you know, any of the measures that, that are possible to take for lorry drivers. My point is that over a long period of time, what we've done in this country is rely on importing cheap European, often Eastern European labour undercutting the domestic market and creating more long-term problems that so we end up never actually getting out of this cycle, which, as I say, has existed for years. I welcome the fact that, you know, lorry uh, drivers are able to attract a better salary, and that's what we need, including better conditions as well. And, you know, 99% of lorry drivers in this country are white, male, average age 55. Uh, we, we need to make this a more attractive uh, industry to go into. And, and the solution to that is to have those slightly higher wages and better conditions at, at uh, truck stops and the like as well. Um, these short term visas, these specialist skilled worker visas, ballerinas are on the list and HGV drivers are not. Well, as, as I say, uh, I, what, I, I wouldn't rule anything out here, but I, what I don't want to do is exacerbate. Yeah, but uh, you, I, that's absurd. Yeah, but, but uh, the difference here is that the real problem that we face, and we know this because as soon as the tests become available, they are snapped up immediately. The real bottleneck in all of this is testing. That is where we need to, to yeah, relieve it. You've made the point as far as that's concerned, Mr Shamps. Well, we're talking about bringing in drivers in the interim to try and fix this problem. We're 110,000 drivers short. There are drivers, 14,000 drivers went home during the pandemic. Only 600 have come back. By any maths, you know, there's a good 10,000, even with slippage, who could come back and at least try to help in the short term. They can't get a skilled worker uh, visa, but a ballerina can. Uh, I should say those numbers are hotly debated, but I won't go into all of that. Um, what I would say is we've got six million, uh, as I say, EU settled and pre-settled status. Many of those people can already drive. We've also got hundreds of thousands of Brits who are able to drive and are being attracted back. So um, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes. As I said, I'll, we'll move heaven and earth and I'll look at any feasible scheme. We've already taken measures which have doubled the number of tests available, including changing the law. Okay. Um, so we're, we're using every lever uh, at our disposal to, to, to do this. Uh, Are you going to look at the uh, skilled worker visa? Is that what you're saying well, or say, not? I, I, absolutely not ruling anything out at all. We want to see this problem resolved, but I also want to see it resolved for the long term, not just a short term fix, which ends up exacerbating the long term as well. How many forecourts were affected this morning? Well, out of BP's uh, 12 or 1,300 forecourts, uh, the, yesterday uh, they told me that five uh, had to be closed throughout the country. And so there's no shortage in terms Not just BP that supplies fuel, though, is there? Uh, BP and um, Tesco, the others, uh, Morrison's and uh, Asda and other supermarkets are saying they have no problems, as have other uh, petrol companies. So it has been quite a defined problem. This is not a shortage of fuel at the refineries, uh, and it's not something new. In fact, when BP doesn't matter made if it is or not. Comments, if you can't get it from the refinery, as, as Tony Blair found out all those years ago, if you can't get it from the refinery to the forecourt. It doesn't matter where the problem is. That was different because they had massive numbers of, uh, of HGV drivers not working. There was an actual strike. There was a blockade. It was a very different situation. Yeah, what I was my going point, to point is out, they actually. couldn't get it from the refinery to the forecourt. That's, a similar, That's going to be a similar problem if we can't get more drivers. My question to you as Transport Secretary this morning is how many forecourts are affected? Well, as I say, five yesterday on the BP forecourts. The point I was going to make, though, uh, Kate... Uh, so Kate, there's only not... five petrol stations forecourts in the whole country that's impacted? 
of, of BP yesterday. That's the case. But Kay, the point I was going to make. What about the others? No, let's point. let's really clarify important. this point because you're saying that there isn't an issue. Uh, all the front pages this morning are saying that there is an issue. The Petrol Retailers Association is saying that there is an issue. They're saying keep a quarter of a tank in your um, ta keep a quarter of fuel in your tank just in case you can't get any. So all of these people are wrong, and you're saying there's only five uh, petrol stations affected. I want to answer this very precisely, so I appreciate it if you just give me 10 seconds to do that. One, I'm not saying there's no issue. There has been an issue, and that's what was reported on. Two, the conversations that were reported out and are in today's paper are from over a week ago and refer to the situation over the previous three months. So what people can see is that although there are stresses and strains in the system, by and large, it had not impacted on people's uh, everyday life when it came to filling up with petrol. Now, what we need to make sure is that we can continue to have more people capable of driving and therefore continue to alleviate the problem or we'll move heaven and earth to do that. How many petrol stations forecourts are affected this morning? As Transport so, Secretary, you must know. So I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that at uh, 7 a.m. in the morning. What I can well, tell what you was is it 10 o'clock last night? Uh, as of last night, five petrol stations on BP network of 12 and 1300 were affected. Yeah. And I'm meeting this morning with Tesco, and I'm sure they'll give me the update uh, for themselves. And none of the other retailers uh, said that they had any closures. Um, how much is Brexit to blame? Well, I've seen people point to Brexit as if it's the uh, the, the culprit here. In fact, they're wrong. Uh, not only are there uh, very large and even larger shortages in other EU countries like Poland and, and Germany, which clearly can't be to do with Brexit, uh, but actually because of Brexit, I've been able to change the law and alter the way that our driving tests operate in a way that I could not have done if we were okay. still part of the EU. So Brexit actually has provided part of the solution of giving more uh, slots available for HGV tests and a lot more, twice as many tests available now uh, than before the pandemic. Uh, a large proportion of those I've only been able to do because we're no longer actually in the EU. OK. How are you feeling about civil servants working from home? Um, London Tech Week conference uh, yesterday, Sarah Healy um, said that she enjoys working from home. She's a top Mandarin so she, because she can spend more time on her Peloton exercise bike. Well, look, I think we're in a world now um, where people, where there is a combination. People were working from home. People are going into the office. I, I had a look, actually. I, I know some the last week for which I have numbers, there were about 1,300 uh, transport official civil servants in the in the office. I, I, I've been in this week, and people are pleased to, to come back to the office. There will be times when people want to work from home. Uh, we are in this sort of transition um, stage through the uh, through the autumn, um, and uh, and I, I think things will settle down into uh, probably more of a hybrid world. But there's nothing like the spark of being in the office, um, uh, as as a lot of my team found this this last week or two. Although you find it very productive being working from home, don't you, Minister? We can never get you in here, can we? I mean, love, love to come and see you. Uh, when, when, hey. when, 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 when? Oh, well, as, as, as soon as you invite me on again, Kay, I'd love okay, to come OK, we'll in. see you I, next I, week I, sometime. I, 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 I... I, I do find genuinely um, that it's helpful to be in the office. There are times where uh, it's quite nice to be at home when you're um, on, the, on the radio first thing. OK. Um, and on the telly box, uh, talk to me about lateral flow tests before I let you go. Um, there were some suggestions that the PCRs would be replaced by lateral flow tests when, uh, in time for uh, half term holidays for the kids. Uh, I was reading yesterday that there aren't enough lateral flow tests and there aren't enough people who will be able to supervise those lateral flow tests via Zoom or whatever. And so that's not going to happen. Is that wrong? I don't think that's right. This is my colleagues over at the Department of Health who've been working very hard on this, and I know they've got the, the date of half term uh, in mind. Um, we did need to give the uh, producers of these things some time because, of course, they've been busily producing PCR tests over the summer um, to switch production to uh, lateral flow. Um, but uh, it, it looks to me like, uh, like they'll be able to step up to that. I noticed actually in Ireland um, yesterday uh, that Lidl came along with a pack of uh, which they're selling in their stores in, 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 in the Republic there, for 25 euros and you get five lateral flow tests. Uh, I uh, you know look forward to the expansion of uh, lateral flow tests, perhaps into supermarkets and elsewhere, um, as, we, as we get on to the point where people can buy those for returning from holiday. So you think a little uh, lateral flow test should be accepted as um, currency enough, or does it have to be a little bit more formal than that? 
Well, they, they, it'll be for the Department of Health to, to set out the rules about how people need to go about this. But remember, with PCR tests, uh, you didn't have to be uh, supervised, as it were. Uh, you had to get that PCR test in advance. You had to record the fact that you'd ordered it, uh, but you were then trusted to get on and, and, and do it. Obviously, the Department of Health will put some guidance in place as to how they want this to operate, and they're still working on that, so I won't tread on their toes. But uh, I, I have every confidence that the system will be got up and running uh, in, in good time. But you're still uh, hopeful that the lateral flow um, ruling will be in place for the half-term holidays? I, I am. As I say, they're, they're working on okay. the detail of this, and the, the, the private market is having to respond to... Uh, that shift to using lateral flows, and of course they'd need hundreds of thousands, even millions of them, available. So um, there's a there's a big task for that. But I, as I say I know my colleagues are working hard on that. Okay, the team will ring you later about coming on next week in the studio. Thanks very much, Lou, for joining. I'm not sure I said next week, but I look forward to being there. Okay, nothing okay. would make me happy. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Still to come on the programme for you, Sakir Starmer under pressure over his planned reforms for Labour. We'll speak to his party chair, Annalise Dodds, just after half past seven. Raising thousands over a cuppa and some cake, we'll talk to two fundraisers for Macmillan's Cancer Coffee Morning at 7.45. And he's only been here for a month, America's top man in the UK, Ambassador Philip T. Rica, joining us for an exclusive TV interview at 8.35. Police are questioning a man in connection with the murder of the teacher, Sabina Nessa, in London. They've also released images of another man who they want to speak with in connection with her death. Ivor Bennett reports. This is the man police would like to speak to as they continue their hunt for Sabina Nessa's killer. He was seen on CCTV in an area close to where she was attacked last Friday. Police have also released this image of a car they're trying to trace, which they believe the man has access to. In a separate development, a 38-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder. The park where Sabina was killed is outside her home in south-east London. Hundreds are expected at a vigil there tonight to call for an end to violence against women. We are supporting the local women in Kidbrook to uh, come together to remember Sabina to say that their community is not a violent place, but also to stand up against violence against women and girls and say that women changing their behaviour isn't the answer, that we need more fundamental changes to keep women safe. The 28-year-old primary school teacher was murdered in a park just outside her home in south-east London. A cause of death still hasn't been established, nor has a motive. Police forensics are focused around a community centre in the middle of Cater Park in Kidbrook Village. It's minutes from Sabina's flat, which she left at 8.30 on Friday night. She was on her way to meet a friend at the depot bar, just five minutes away, but never made it. Her body was found by a dog walker the following afternoon. It's really upsetting um, to think that someone living so local, um, just going to the same pub I've literally just come from, Yes, yeah, quite shocking, really. Sabina lived in that building there. It overlooks the park. This is the path she walked on that cuts through the middle of the park. Her body was found just behind those trees there. It's barely 100 metres from where she lived, practically on her doorstep. The path is lit at night, but many residents say they avoid walking here after dark because they don't feel safe. I keep looking at single men, believe it or not, and thinking, oh, I hope you're not the murderer. That, that's just a natural instinct. But because um, there's so many people about, I, I, I feel OK, but I'm nervous still. Does it make you think twice about coming here at night? Oh, I won't come here at night, never. Downing Street said the Prime Minister's focus is on making streets safe for everybody. But Labour say it's not enough and want violence against women to be treated like terrorism. We see piecemeal, a little pilot here, a review done there, when in reality we need a whole-scale system change that prioritises violence against women and girls the way we prioritise terrorism in this country. Police insist the streets of the capital are safe for women, but for many here, they are words that offer little reassurance. Ivor Bennett, Sky News, Kidbrook. Fears of more damage as lava from a volcanic eruption on the Canary Islands reaches as high as 50 feet in places. Officials say eruptions seem to be decreasing. Ashna Hurignar 
Forgive me, Ashna Hurinag has the latest from La Palma. It is now day six on the island and the volcano behind me, the Cumbre Vieja, continues to spit out that hot, molten rock. It is splintering and it is spitting so ferociously that we've not just seen those thick ash clouds rising to, into the air, but we've also seen the continuation of that hot lava pouring out. And now we know that we... We know there have been more registered explosions um, late afternoon and again it looks even more ferocious today and arguably we could see the same thing happening uh, later on. Giant boulders are completely uh, tumbling from it. We know that some of that rock is firing some 1,000 feet into the air. We now know there are two rivers of lava and at their meeting point we know it stretches some 600 metres but it as, is as spectacular as it is destructive. Um, we know that that thick smog that it is causing to rise up into the air is now threatening airspace. We have heard about delays at La Palma Airport only yesterday. It's likely we'll see similar scenes happening today. Of course, the challenge now really is to get those residents, to get those local people back to safety, back to places where they can actually call home. We went to a donation centre yesterday and we saw everything from items of clothing to toiletries to bedding people in this community have really rallied round and put their arms round each other because they know that something like this doesn't happen very often the last time it exploded was 15 years ago so or 50 years ago i should say so they know that this is such an extraordinary moment in history that people are going to need all the help they can get. And what we saw yesterday was an extraordinary communi community effort. But the real worry now is that there are a sh there is a shortage of rental accommodation, that many people are being housed in at least temporary forms of accommodation, things like hotels, but something more permanent will urgently need to be found for them. Also making news for us this morning here on Sky, parts of southern Spain have been hit by record rainfall and floods. The president of Andalusia has declared a public emergency after dozens of homes and businesses were badly damaged. Derek Chauvin, the former police officer jailed for the murder of George Floyd, has launched an appeal against his conviction. He was jailed for 22 and a half years early this year after being convicted of murder and manslaughter. Warning that thousands of cancer patients in England could die over the next decade because of backlog of cancer diagnosis and treatment. The Institute for Public Policy Research says more than 19,000 people are living with undiagnosed cancer due to misappointments. Claimed England is on track to have diagnosed 95% of people living with HIV by 2025. Public Health England says the development makes it possible to eliminate transmission in England by 2030. Very quick look at the weather. The next uh, few days for you are going to bring some light rain to the north and west before turning more unsettled from Sunday. Now, as part of the build-up to the new James Bond movie, the Royal Navy has decided to honour the actor who currently plays Britain's most famous spy. Uh, Daniel Craig shares something else with James Bond, the rank of commander. He was presented with the honour by the head of the Navy First Sea Lord Admiral Tony Radekin. There he is, there they are. It comes ahead of the premiere of No Time to Die, Craig's last outing as 007. And I cannot wait to watch that next week. What about you? Let me know. Are you looking forward to it too? At Kay Burley, if you would like to tweet me directly. Now, the Labour Party conference begins in Brighton tomorrow. Party chair Annalise Dodds joins us in just a moment.
Hello, everyone. The Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, has told us that he'll do everything in his power to resolve the lack of HGV drivers, which has now forced some petrol stations to close. But he hasn't committed to extending the skilled worker visa uh, scheme to recruit drivers from outside the UK. I'll look at everything and we'll move to heaven and earth to do whatever we can to um, make sure that shortages are uh, alleviated with uh, HGV drivers. But uh, we, we need to look at the things which are going to make a difference. And the big problem is the, the, the testing of drivers coming in. You get an attrition rate, people retire. If you can't get new people in and we, we, we were unable to test 40,000 drivers during coronavirus, that's the principal um, problem. But the Transport Secretary rejected suggestions that Brexit is to blame for a shortage of drivers. The Road Haulage Association has called for those temporary visas to allow more foreign drivers to work in the UK. But Grant Chaps told us Brexit just wasn't to blame. I've seen people point to Brexit as if it's the, uh, the, the culprit here. In fact, they're wrong. Uh, not only are there uh, very large and even larger shortages in other EU countries like Poland and, and Germany, which clearly can't be to do with Brexit, uh, but actually because of Brexit, I've been able to change the law and alter the way that our driving tests operate in a way that I could not have done if we were still part of the EU. So Brexit actually has provided part of the solution of giving more uh, slots available for HGV tests and a lot more, twice as many tests available now uh, than before the pandemic. Uh, a large proportion of those I've only been able to do because we're no longer actually in the EU. Well, Labour's unveiled an ambitious plan for more affordable housing. That's ahead of its annual conference, which starts um, tomorrow. Talk about that and other things with the chair of the party, Annalise Dodds. Hello to Ms Dodds. Thanks for joining us uh, on the programme this morning. Uh, just uh, picking up off the back of Grant Shapps there, he was saying nothing to worry about as far as fuel shortages are concerned. Do you feel reassured? Well, unfortunately, I don't. And I think there are families up and down the country who are really concerned about this. Of course, they're looking at their family finances, anticipating or already being impacted by those increases in fuel costs. Of course, they'll also see national insurance going up now as well and potentially universal credit being cut if they're one of those many families in the UK who are working and having to top that up with universal credit. This is a real triple hammer blow that we're seeing on people's finances right now. And government could act on this. They could act swiftly. They could, for example, reverse that cut to universal credit. They should instead target that tax burden much more on those with the broadest shoulders. And they could do things like, for example, automatically switch on the warm home support that people need. Of course, in the longer term, we really need to see the government grasping the nettle of more resilient energy supply, something that, for example, Rachel Reeves has been pushing for for a long time. But that's immediate measures that the government could take now to get our country to a better place. All of that said, and um, the fact that it's your party conference um, starting this weekend, Labour has only put up um, two out of five days politicians to come to talk to us and rebut what the government has had to say for itself. So what sort of message do you think that sends to my viewers? Well, Kay, you know that I'm always keen to speak with you. I don't I've, know exactly Yes, what and it's fantastic here. that you're here. My point <laughs> is that there are three other days out of the five this week where your colleagues could have come on and made the robust points that you just have, uh, especially ahead of your party conference, especially because your leader's trying to reboot the party. And it's an open goal that you don't take. So I suppose my viewers might think that you're in somewhat of a disarray. Well, I have to say, Kay, I don't know what went on there, but I would say, um, without going into too many details, I last week had norovirus. I wonder whether there was something like that that might have cropped up and maybe meant that there was an issue there. And certainly, as I say, I'm very keen to always appear because I really want to make sure that Labour is having that dialogue uh, with your viewers. I think that's incredibly important. So uh, I'm sure that it was more to do with uh, some kind of logistical issues rather than anything uh, more serious than that. Well, as party chairman, I hope that is the case and that we'll see more of your colleagues next week. Are you feeling better now? <laughs> Bless you, I really am. Yes, yes, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I really feel for uh, anybody who, who does get that, who's got existing health conditions, uh, quite grim, unfortunately. You're here also to talk about the housing crisis and what Labour plans to do to tackle that. Absolutely. And I think we've seen that situation in housing getting harder and harder 
for families up and down our country. Of course, we've seen the rate of home ownership going down very substantially, particularly within the under 45s. So Labour is saying now that we can radically change things here. You know, first of all, we can have those requirements for affordable housing that actually mean something. At the moment, the government's definition of affordability relates to the overall market cost of housing. That's so far out of many people's reach that it's pretty much meaningless. We said instead that we would peg that affordability to actually people's wages, to the money that they've got coming in. That would make so much more sense. It would really force developers to be providing far more genuinely affordable housing that people really need. We've also said that for those first time buyers, they should be able to have the first chance when there's a new development with that new housing, that they should have the first chance to be able to get that first rung on the housing ladder that's so important. And as I said, with those rates of home ownership going down in our country, it's really important that we do help people to get that security. Okay. HGV drivers, not enough of them, more than 100,000 short, nothing to do with Brexit is what the Transport Secretary says. Well, I wish the Transport Secretary would actually be taking action for the future. We've got a difficult situation right now, but when I talk with business, they're not only worried about the situation now, they're very concerned about what will happen in just a few months when we'll see a, a new veterinary situation coming into play because the UK has not got that agreement with the EU on veterinary standards. That could mean big, big delays when we also have much more customs bureaucracy coming in at the start of next year as well. And again, the government doesn't seem to have any plan. Really, what people like Grant Schatz, with all respect to him, need to be doing is engaging with business right now, listening to them, understanding the problems and taking action, because this already difficult situation could actually get even more intense unless they start to get a grip. So you accept, though, that he says that it's nothing to do with Brexit? Well, there are shortages of HGV drivers in other countries. I mean, I have to say that there have, however, been big failures in planning for this situation and the additional red tape that's been created, which was not inevitable. It was not an inevitable result of Brexit in many cases, but that hasn't been tackled by government. You know, I talk to uh, advanced manufacturers uh, in my patch, for example, and they tell me that now they've got to fill in, you know, dozens of pages of paperwork. And that's quite a tall order for an HGV driver if they've got to be dealing with all of that, as well as getting goods from one place to another. So undoubtedly, the government's method of implementing Brexit has had an impact overall on the system, but there are other factors that are in play here. And I think their failure to consider you know, whether they need to ask that migration advisory committee about a different approach to shortage occupations. You know, I really do think that they should be engaging with business on this and listening to them. OK, um, it is the party conference, as I said, um, end of the week and into next week. Um, the leader came up with his 14,000 word vision, not sure how well it landed, uh, to the extent where Ian Lavery MP, speaking to us here on the programme uh, yesterday, or Sky News yesterday, I should say, saying there's a one in five chance that Keir Starmer could be gone by the end of the year. Well, I think that's uh, a slightly strange comment for Ian to make, with all due respect to him, and I do get on with Ian, but I think that Keir's essay was a really strong attempt to say, look, we've come through this crisis together as a country. It has been incredibly difficult, but we've actually seen what we can do. We've seen how we can work together, for example, to support each other, to create that vaccine, to build those ventilators. We've seen what our country can do. And Keir, in that essay, was saying, how can we face up to those new challenges of the future with what we know now about what the British people, British business, British trade unions, what they can do together. Um, so if any of your viewers have the time, I would really recommend that they do read that essay. I think uh, those thousands of words will pass pretty quickly because it's a really engaging read. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care. Tamara Curran is um, here. Hi, Tamara. Interesting uh, comments there from Annalise Dodds and indeed Grant Shapps earlier.
Yeah, she's saying that the government's handling of Brexit has contributed to this lorry driver shortage, which is causing problems at what Grant Shapp says is a handful of forecourts. People shouldn't panic or go and try and buy panic buy petrol. He says people should buy petrol as normal, uh, but he'll be trying to keep uh, across the situation today to see if any more are affected. Um, he says that the government is doing uh, a lot to try and uh, get more HGV drivers through the system to tackle the backlog of tests that built up uh, during COVID. But clearly, this is a, a long-term issue. We've got 100,000 uh, vacancies there, and you've already got Conservative MPs saying we should look at getting visas so that lorry drivers who are not currently considered skilled workers in the post-Brexit immigration system are able to come, say, for a year to uh, cover the period while we try and train up UK drivers and Labour saying that they would support that kind of measure. OK, for now. Tomorrow, thank you. Let's find out what's happening as far as the sport is concerned with Jackie. Ah, record breakers. Me too. World's slowest dog. This sports bulletin is brought to you by the Vitality Running World Cup. So Emma, many congratulations. What does it feel like to be home? Yeah, it's a really nice feeling to be home. I have been able to spend some time with my parents after not seeing them for seven weeks. So... We, we just had a nice meal together last night with some homemade dumplings and uh, I rewatched the final just to just to relive some experiences. And what was that like? Were you tense rewatching the final? Yeah, I just really wanted to let the moment sink in and I thought that would help. But um, it, I knew exactly what was going to happen in all of the points. But watching is definitely more stressful than playing because you feel like you have control at least when you're playing. When you're watching... Um, you, you you have no control and but it was really cool to just be able to relive some of those moments and at the end I I saw my slide when I fell and uh, it was quite long and I actually impressed myself with that in slow motion. <laughs> it, it was a very impressive slide. When you saw your mum and dad for the first time you know what did they say to you because well played doesn't really cover it does it? Yeah they just gave me a hug. Um, there was nothing really crazy. They have very high standards and uh, tough love, but I think that I didn't really need anything big from them. I know that just the smallest of congratulations means a lot and uh, for them to say they're proud of me as well. But they, they were very happy to have me home. Life-changing experience, Emma. You know, reporters, paparazzi outside of your house. You are instantly recognisable everywhere. Uh, are you ready for that? How much your life has now changed? Yeah, I actually haven't really realised because I just came home and I've just been staying at home, spending time with my family. So I haven't really gone out or, or uh, done anything yet. So I don't really see at the moment any changes. Well, you've been super busy since that match point. You've done loads of things at New York. You've done chat shows. You've been to the Met Gala where you looked fantastic. Um, what was the highlight of all those things that you did because you won? Thank you. I think the highlight of my time after the final was honestly that night that of the final, I just spent it with my team in. Morning. I'll join later. 30 years ago, Nirvana released their second album, Nevermind, which catapulted the band and its frontman, Kurt Cobain, to international fame. Still hugely popular, despite the death of Cobain in 1994. Here's our arts and entertainment correspondent, Katie Spencer. Stephanie Phillips was only three years old when Nevermind first came out. I think those four opening chords are just really kind of revolutionary to me. Like so many who own the album, its songs are now second nature. Anyone can play them, and that's why I love them. Shortly after Nevermind's release, the small alternative rock group from Seattle would become one of the biggest bands in the world. A defining record of the grunge movement. They said to a lot of their fans, if you're going to be racist or homophobic, don't come to our shows, don't buy our records, we don't want anything to do with you. Which is a really clear stance and 
could be like derided as cancel culture now, but back then it was just a band being political and being honest. But would the album have been as talked about if Kurt Cobain was still alive? I've never really understood why people rave about Nevermind 30 years on, to be honest. Music writer Everett True was a friend of the band. They just had a wicked sense of humour, you know, you just get up to the most mischief you possibly could, setting curtains alike, alight in dressing rooms, throwing... You know, they did the whole kind of cliché band thing for a while, kind of throwing TVs out the window. Kurt Cobain's rock star antics offstage might not have been relatable, but his weariness and frustration on the recording spoke to the disillusioned, the disenfranchised. That screen really did, you know, capture that kind of feeling of angst, of loneliness, of just not being able to cope with the outside world. It is impossible to list all the artists who cite Nirvana as a formative influence. I think it's caused a lot of guitar players to retrain and suddenly they're sort of hiding their technical ability, which can be a bit spidery. And there was all these guys that, um, that I would be in football teams with who showed no interest in music at all. And then within about three months of uh, Nevermind coming out, they're all playing guitar. They're all singing. I'm so excited. I can't wait to meet you. They led a cultural rebellion rejecting the mainstream. And 30 years on, to successive generations, that rage is just as raw. Katie Spencer, Sky News. One of the biggest cancer fundraising events takes place this month. We'll talk to two of those who've raised tens of thousands through Tea and Cake next. Siobhan Robbins, Sky Southeast Asia correspondent in Bangkok. That has happened within minutes and now it's coming from both sides and it's moving this way. Clearly not had very much to eat at all, a lot of them extremely thin and very frail. The people here are praying quietly to themselves. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. Now they're trying to finish the job off so that they can move into the square. Okay, it's okay, don't worry, it's okay. They're becoming very sensitive of having the media around. They have no protective masks or protective equipment at all. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in the news. Every time they touch them, they spray, spray, spray. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Perilously close to the vineyards. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. We don't understand that every lake or a pond is a habitat in itself, which houses frogs, snakes, crabs, turtles, birds, so many different life forms. Human beings directly depend on underground water source. So a lake or a pond is necessary to replenish these groundwater resources. Does anyone know 
which particular parts of your body can be damaged by air pollution. The weather continues to be warm for the time of year. Today it'll be central and eastern areas that see the best of the sunshine, whilst low cloud, patchy rain and drizzle will tend to spill its way in from the northwest. But we are looking at a top temperature of around 24 degrees Celsius, that's 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll be breezy everywhere with some gales across the northern Isles this afternoon. And those strong winds are actually uh, helping with the air pollution levels, which look like staying low throughout the day. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. A Cup for Cancer, one of the biggest annual events to raise funds for people living with cancer, takes place later on today. Let's find out more about the world's biggest coffee morning. Joining us is Macmillan fundraiser Caroline Mallon and also breast cancer patient uh, Jenny Powell. Hello to you both. Thank you for joining us on the programme. Um, Caroline, to you first of all, tell us about the Macmillan Coffee Morning for those who don't know about it. Well, I started the movement at Millen Coffee Morning about 15 years ago after um, seeing an advert in the Good Housekeeping magazine um, saying to raise money for, for charity from at Millen. Um, I can't run a marathon, but I can bake. So I started, um, as I say, 15 years ago and raised my first coffee morning, £625. Um, 16, 16 years later, I've now raised just over £30,000. Um, I have um, people coming to my house, making, I make them tea and coffee, uh, I sell baking, I do a raffle, lucky dip, uh, lots of different things, um, and it's just become something every year that I do. I start baking um, in May, um, I make jam, um, I've got jam here, raspberry jam, um, I make apple pies, chocolate fudge, um, and yes, it's it's a, it's a lovely event and it's something that I can do for Macmillan Cancer Support. That's amazing. Good for you. Good for you. And Jenny, it makes all the difference to people like you, doesn't it? Because it helps um, bolster the funds of Macmillan. How did Macmillan help you? Um, so Macmillan kind of helped, they helped me from the very start. As soon as I found out that I had cancer, I um, there was a lady called Emma, who's my Macmillan nurse. And she has been there emotionally supporting me, supporting my family. And um, I also have a lady called Debbie who's part of the Macmillan Welfare Advisor and she's helped me. So um, the coffee mornings help obviously to raise money for Macmillan. And Macmillan gave me £350 grant, which um, that helped me to fund all of my surgical bras and wigs and just anything that I kind of really needed to take the stress away from everything, which is amazing. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. Um, Caroline, how do people get involved if they want to, looking at pictures there, Jenny, as we're chatting to you. Caroline, how do people get involved uh, with a, can with a uh, coffee morning if they want to or um, have the resources? Well, um, you, you um, just go on the Macmillan website and they send you a pack with things like um, flags and invitations. And, I mean, lots of people do a, a coffee morning and they only raise £100. They just have their friends and you don't need to bake. You can just even buy um, things from supermarket. And, and up here I've got my, my donation boxes. Um, you can do it online or whatever, but... Every small amount counts for Macmillan, whether it's 50 pence a pound. Um, and sometimes shops have, 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 the restaurants have the coffee morning, but I just do it in my own house. Um, and I have all my family helping me. I have friends helping me on the day. It's not just really about me, it's about my family um, because it's five months out of my year. But again, you can just do it. You can just go to, to a shop and buy some, some things have tea and coffee and ask people for a donation. Every penny counts as 98% of um, Macmillan is funded by um, people like me. Um, so yes, that, that, that's, that's how you do that. That's amazing, looking at pictures of you uh, there as, as we're chatting. Um, Jenny, tell me about um, how you're getting on with uh, your cancer diagnosis. We've seen some pictures of you there, Jenny, and um, it does look, I mean, looking at you this morning, you look as though you're doing very well. Yes, thank you. So um, I found out in November that I have breast cancer and in the December, actually it was the 21st, so two days before Christmas, 
I had my mastectomy. I've had radiotherapy in May, but I have the all clear now. I am on medication for the next 10 years, but apart from that, it's all good. That's absolutely um, amazing. You've got lots of baking behind you. Um, what do you do today? So we, I actually work at Sean's Bakery in Redbourne. So we are doing a coffee morning here. We've been running it since Monday. And um, today is going to be the final day. So we're really going to be pushing it. Um, I think we've raised a total of £750 so far. But we do have a Facebook link if anyone wants to top up there. That's absolutely amazing. Have a great day, ladies. Hopefully you'll Thank raise you. lots of money for Macmillan and it's good to uh, talk to you this morning, especially with those magnificent displays behind you. Thank you both very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you.